This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strange Pages from Family Papers by T. F. Thistleton Dyer Chapter 10 Family Death Omens Say not, tis vain. I tell thee, some are warned by a meteor's light, or a pale bird flitting calls them home, or a voice on the winds by night, and they must go. And he too, he, woe for the fall of the glorious tree. Mrs. Hemans a curious chapter in the history of many of our old county families is that relating to certain forewarnings which, from time immemorial, have been supposed to indicate the approach of death. However incredible the existence of these may seem, their appearance is still intimately associated with certain houses, instances of which have been recorded from time to time. Thus Cuckfield Place, Sussex, is not only interesting as a fine Elizabethan mansion, but as having suggested to Ainsworth the Rookwood Hall of his striking romance. The supernatural occurrence, he says, forming the groundwork of one of the ballads which I have made the harbinger of doom to the house of Rookwood, is ascribed by popular superstition to a family resident in Sussex, upon whose estate the fatal tree, a gigantic lime with mighty arms and huge girth of trunk, is still carefully preserved. In the avenue that winds towards the house, the doom tree still stands. And whether gale or calm prevail, or threatening cloud hath fled, by hand of fate predestinate a limb that tree will shed. A verdant bough untouched, I trow, by axe or tempest's breath, to Rookwood's head, an omen dread of fast approaching death. Cuckfield Place, adds Ainsworth, to which this singular piece of timber is attached, is the real Rookwood Hall, for I have not drawn upon imagination, but upon memory, in describing the seat and domains of that fated family. A similar tradition is associated with the Edgewell Oak, which is said to indicate the coming death of an inmate of Castle Dalhousie by the fall of one of its branches, and Camden, in his Magna Britannia, alluding to the antiquity of the Brereton family, relates this peculiar fact which is reported to have been repeated many times. This wonderful thing respecting them is commonly believed, and I have heard it myself affirmed by many, that for some days before the death of the heir of the family, the trunk of a tree has always been seen floating in the lake adjoining their mansion. A popular superstition, to which Mrs. Hemans refers in the lines which head the present chapter. A further instance of a similar kind is given by Sir Bernard Burke, who informs us that opposite the dining-room at Gordon Castle is a large and massive willow tree, the history of which is somewhat singular. Duke Alexander, when four years old, planted this willow in a tub filled with earth. The tub floated about in a marshy piece of land, till the shrub, expanding, burst its cerements and struck root in the earth below. Here it grew and prospered, till it attained its present goodly size. It is said the duke regarded the tree with a sort of fatherly and even superstitious regard, half believing there was some mysterious affinity between its fortune and his own. If an accident happened to the one, by storm or lightning, some misfortune was not long in befalling the other. It has been noted also that the same thing is related of the brave but unfortunate Admiral Kempenfelt, who went down in the Royal George off Portsmouth. During his proprietary of Lady Place, he and his brother planted two thorn trees, but one day, on coming home, the brother noted that the tree planted by the Admiral had completely withered away. Astonished at this unexpected sight, he felt some apprehensions as to Admiral Kempenfelt's safety, and exclaimed with some emotion, I feel sure that this is an omen that my brother is dead. By a striking coincidence his worst fears were realised, for on that evening came the terrible news of the loss of the Royal George. Whenever any member of the family of Kirkpatrick of Closeburn, in the county of Dumfries, was about to die, either by accident or disease, 
a swan that was never seen but on such occasions, was sure to make its appearance upon the lake which surrounded Closeburn Castle, coming no one knew whence, and passing away as mysteriously when the predicted death had taken place, in connection with which the following singular legend has been handed down. In days gone by the lake of Closeburn Castle was the favourite resort during the summer season of a pair of swans, their arrival always being welcome to the family at the castle, from a long-established belief that they were ominous of good fortune to the Kirkpatricks. No matter, it is said, what mischance might have before impended, it was sure to cease at their coming, and so suddenly as well as constantly, that it required no very ardent superstition to connect the two events into cause and effect. But a century and a half had passed away, when it happened that the young heir of Closeburn Castle, a lad of not quite thirteen years of age, in one of his visits to Edinburgh, attended at the theatre a performance of The Merchant of Venice, in the course of which he was surprised to hear Portia say of Bassanio that he should make a swan-like end, fading in music. Often wondering whether swans really sang before dying, he determined, at the first opportunity, to test the truth of these words for himself. On his return home, he was one day walking by the lake, when the swans came sailing majestically towards him, and at once reminded of Portia's remark. Without a moment's thought, he lodged in the breast of the foremost one a bolt from his crossbow, killing it instantly. Frightened at what he had done, he made up his mind it should not be known, and as the water drifted the dead body of the bird towards the shore, he buried it deep in the ground. No small surprise, however, was occasioned in the neighbourhood, when, for several years, no swans made their annual appearance, the idea at last being that they must have died in their native home, wherever that might chance to be. The yearly visit of the swans of Closeburn had become a thing of the past, when one day much excitement was caused by the return of a single swan, and much more so when a deep, blood-red stain was observed upon its breast. As might be expected, this unlooked-for occurrence occasioned grave suspicions, even amongst those who had no great faith in omens, and that such fears were not groundless was soon abundantly clear, for in less than a week the lord of Closeburn Castle died suddenly. Thereupon the swan vanished, and was seen no more for some years, when it again appeared to announce the loss of one of the house by shipwreck. The last recorded appearance of the bird was at the third nuptials of Sir Thomas Kirkpatrick, the first baronet of that name. On the wedding day his son Roger was walking by the lake, when, on a sudden, as if it had emerged from the waters, the swan appeared with the bleeding breast. Roger had heard of this mysterious swan, and although his father's wedding bells were ringing merrily, he himself returned to the castle a sorrowful man, for he felt convinced that some evil was hanging over him. Despite his father's jest at what he considered groundless superstition on his part, the young man could not shake off his fears, replying to his father, Perhaps before long you also may be sorrowful. On the night of that very day, the sun died, and here ends the strange story of the swans of Closeburn. Similarly, whenever two owls are seen perched on the family mansion of the noble family of Arundel of Wardour, it has long been regarded as a certain indication that one of its members before very long will be summoned out of the world, and the appearance of a white-breasted bird was the death-warning of the Oxenham family, particulars relating to the tragic origin of which are to be found in a local ballad which commences thus. Where lofty hills in grandeur meet, and tor meandering flows, There is a sylvan calm retreat, where erst a mansion rose. There dwelt Sir James of Oxenham, a brave and generous lord, Benighted travellers never came unwelcome to his board. In early life his wife had died, a son he ne'er had known, And Margaret, his age's pride, was heir to him alone. In course of time Margaret became affianced to a young knight, and their wedding day was fixed. On the evening preceding it, her father, in accordance with custom, gave a banquet to his friends, in order that they might congratulate him on the approaching happy union. He stood up to thank them for their kind wishes, and, in alluding to the young knight, in a few hours' time to be his daughter's husband, he jestingly called him his son. But while the dear unpractised word still lingered on his tongue, he saw a silvery-breasted bird fly o'er the festive throng. Swift as the lightning flashes fleet and lose their brilliant light, 
Sir James sank back upon his seat, pale and entranced with fright. With some difficulty he managed to conceal the cause of his embarrassment, but on the following day the priest had scarcely begun the marriage service, when Margaret, with terrific screams, made all with horror start. Good heavens! Her blood in torrents streams, a dagger in her heart. The deed had been done by a discarded lover, who, by the aid of a clever disguise, had managed to station himself just behind her. Now marry me, proud maid, he cried. Thy blood with mine shall wed. He dashed the dagger in his side, and at her feet fell dead. And this pathetic ballad concludes by telling us how Poor Margaret too grows cold with death, And round her, hovering, flies the phantom bird For her last breath, to bear it to the skies. Equally strange is the omen with which the ancient baronet's family of Clifton, of Clifton Hall in Nottinghamshire, is forewarned when death is about to visit one of its members. It appears that in this case the omen takes the shape of a sturgeon, which is seen forcing itself up the River Trent, on whose bank the mansion of the Clifton family is situated. And, it may be remembered, how in the park of Chartley, near Lichfield, there has long been preserved the breed of the indigenous Staffordshire cow, of white sand colour, with black ears, muzzle and tips at the hooves. In the year of the Battle of Burton Bridge, a black calf was born, and the downfall of the great house of Ferrers, happening at the same period, gave rise to the tradition which to this day has been current in the neighbourhood, that the birth of a particoloured calf from the wild breed in Chartley Park is a sure omen of death within the same year to a member of the family. By a noticeable coincidence, a calf of this description has been born whenever a death has happened in the family of late years. The decease of the Earl and his Countess, of his son Lord Tamworth, of his daughter Mrs William Joliffe, as well as the deaths of the son and heir of the eighth Earl and his daughter Lady Frances Shirley, were each preceded by the ominous birth of a calf. In the spring of the year 1835, an animal perfectly black was carved by one of this mysterious tribe in the park of Chartley, and it was soon followed by the death of the Countess. The park of Chartley, where this weird announcement of one of the family's death has oftentimes caused so much alarm, is a wild, romantic spot, and was in days of old attached to the royal forest of Needwood and the honour of Tutbury of the whole of which the ancient family of Ferrers were the puissant lords. Their immense possessions, now forming part of the Duchy of Lancaster, were forfeited by the attainder of Earl Ferrers after his defeat at Burton Bridge, where he led the rebellious barons against Henry III. The Chartley estate, being settled in Dower, was alone reserved, and has been handed down to its present possessor. Of Chartley Castle itself, which appears to have been in ruins for many years, Many interesting historical facts are recorded. Thus it is said Queen Elizabeth visited her favourite, the Earl of Essex, here in August, 1575, and was entertained by him in a half-timbered house, which formerly stood near the castle, but was long since destroyed by fire. It is questionable whether Mary Queen of Scots was imprisoned in this house, or in a portion of the old castle. Certain, however, it is that the unfortunate Queen was brought to Chartley from Tutbury on Christmas Day, 1585. The exact date at which she left Chartley is uncertain, but it appears she was removed thence under a plea of taking the air, without the bounds of the castle. She was then conducted by daily stages, from the house of one gentleman to another, under pretence of doing her honour, without her having the slightest idea of her destination, until she found herself on the 20th of September within the fatal walls of Fotheringhay Castle. Cortachy Castle, the seat of the Earl of Airlie, has for many years past been famous for its mysterious drummer, for whenever the sound of his drum is heard it is regarded as the sure indication of the approaching death of a member of the Ogilvy family. There is a tragic origin given to this curious phenomenon, the story generally told being to the effect that either the drummer or some officer whose emissary he was had excited the jealousy of a former Lord Airely, and that he was in consequence of this occurrence put to death by being thrust into his own drum and flung from the window of the tower, in which is situated the chamber where his music is apparently chiefly heard. It is also said that the drummer threatened to haunt the family if his life were taken, a promise which he has not forgotten to fulfil. Then there is the well-known tradition that, prior to the death of any of the lords of Roslyn, Roslyn Chapel appears to be on fire, a weird occurrence which forms the subject of Harold's song in 
the lay of the last minstrel. O'er oh, Rosalind, all that dreary night a wondrous blaze was seen to gleam. Twas broader than the watchfire light, and redder than the bright moonbeam. It glared on Rosalind's castled rock, it rudded all the copsewood glen. Twas seen from Dryden's groves of oak, and seen from caverned Hawthornden. Seemed all on fire that chapel proud, where Rosalind's chief son coffined lie. Each baron, for a sable shroud, sheathed in his iron panoply. Seemed all on fire, within, around, deep sacristy and altars pale, shone every pillar, foliage bound, and glimmered all the dead men's mail. Blazed battlement and pinnet high, blazed every rose-carved buttress fair. So still they blaze when fate is nigh the lordly line of Hugh Sinclair. But, although the last Roslyn, as he was called, died in the year 1778, and the estate passed into the possession of the Erskines, Earls of Roslyn, the old tradition has not been extinguished. Something of the same kind is described as having happened to the old Cornish family of the Vingos on their estate of Treville, for through all time a peculiar token has marked the coming death of one of the family. Above the deep caverns in the Treville cliff rises a carn. On this chains of fire were seen ascending and descending, and oftentimes were accompanied by loud and frightful noises, but it is reported that these tokens have not taken place since the last male of the family came to a violent end. According to Mr. Hunt, Tradition tells us this estate was given to an old family who came with the conqueror to this country. This ancestor is said to have been the Duke of Normandy's wine taster, and to have belonged to the ancient counts of Treville, hence the name of the estate. For many generations the family has been declining, and the race is now nearly, if not quite, extinct. In some cases, families have been apprised of an approaching death by some strange spectre, either male or female, a remarkable instance of which occurs in the manuscript memoirs of Lady Fanshawe, and is to this effect. Her husband, Sir Richard, and she chanced, during their abode in Ireland, to visit a friend who resided in his ancient baronial castle surrounded with a moat. At midnight, she was awakened by a ghastly and supernatural scream, and, looking out of bed, beheld by the moonlight a female face, and part of the form hovering at the window. The face was that of a young and rather handsome woman, but pale, and the hair, which was reddish, was loose and dishevelled. This apparition continued to exhibit itself for some time, and then vanished with two shrieks, similar to that which had first excited Lady Fanshawe's attention. In the morning, with infinite terror, she communicated to her host what had happened, and found him prepared not only to credit, but to account for what had happened. A near relation of mine, said he, expired last night in the castle. Before such an event happens in this family and castle, the female spectre whom you have seen is always visible. She is believed to be the spirit of a woman of inferior rank, whom one of my ancestors degraded himself by marrying, and whom, afterwards, to expiate the dishonour done his family, he caused to be drowned in the castle moat. This, of course, was none other than the Banshee, which in times past has been the source of so much terror in Ireland. Amongst the innumerable stories told of its appearance may be mentioned one related by Mrs. Le Fanu, the niece of Sheridan, in the memoirs of her grandmother, Mrs. Frances Sheridan. From this account we gather that Miss Elizabeth Sheridan was a firm believer in the Banshee, and firmly maintained that the one attached to the Sheridan family was distinctly heard lamenting beneath the windows of the family residence before the news arrived from France of Mrs. Frances Sheridan's death at Blois. She adds that a niece of Miss Sheridan's made her very angry by observing that as Mrs. Frances Sheridan was by birth a Chamberlain, a family of English extraction, she had no right to the guardianship of an Irish fairy, and that therefore the Banshee must have made a mistake. Likewise, many a Scotch family has its death warning, a notable one being the Bodach Glass, which Sir Walter Scott has introduced in his Waverley as the messenger of bad tidings to the MacIvers, the truth of which, it is said, has been traditionally proved by the experience of no less than three hundred years. It is thus described by Fergus to Waverley, 
You must know that when my ancestor, Jan van Heistel, wanted Northumberland, there was appointed with him in the expedition a sort of Southland chief, or captain of a band of lowlanders called Halbert Hall. In their return through the Cheviots they quarrelled about the division of the great booty they had acquired, and came from words to blows. The lowlanders were cut off to a man, and their chief fell the last, covered with wounds, by the sword of my ancestor. Since that day his spirit has crossed the Vichian war of the day when any great disaster was impending. Fergus then gives to Waverley a graphic and detailed account of the appearance of the Bodach. Last night I felt so feverish that I left my quarters and walked out in hopes the keen frosty air would brace my nerves. I crossed a small footbridge and kept walking backwards and forwards when I observed with surprise by the clear moonlight a tall figure in a grey plaid which, move at what pace I would, kept regularly about four yards before me. You saw a Cumberland peasant in his ordinary dress, probably. No, I thought so at first, and was astonished at the man's audacity in daring to dog me. I called to him, but received no answer. I felt an anxious troubling at my heart, and to ascertain what I dreaded I stood still and turned myself on the same spot successively to the four points of the compass. By heaven, Edward, turn where I would, the figure was instantly before my eyes at precisely the same distance. I was then convinced it was the Bodach glass. My hair bristled, and my knees shook. I manned myself, however, and determined to return to my quarters. My ghastly visitor glided before me until he reached the footbridge. There he stopped and turned full round. I must either wade the river or pass him as close as I am to you. A desperate courage, founded on the belief that my death was near, made me resolve to make my way in despite of him. I made the sign of the cross, drew my sword, and uttered, In the name of God, evil spirit, give place. Vich, Jan Vor, it said in a voice that made my very blood curdle. Beware of tomorrow. It seemed at that moment not half a yard from my sword's point. But the words were no sooner spoken than it was gone, and nothing appeared further to obstruct my passage. An ancestor of the family of Maclean of Lockborough was commonly reported before the death of any of his race to gallop along the sea beach, announcing the event by dismal cries and lamentations. And Sir Walter Scott, in his Peveril of the Peak, tells us that the Stanley family are forewarned of the approach of death by a female spirit, weeping and bemoaning herself before the death of any person of distinction belonging to the family. These family death omens are of a most varied description, having assumed particular forms in different localities. Corby Castle, Cumberland, was famed for its radiant boy, a luminous apparition, which occasionally made its appearance, the tradition in the family being that the person who happened to see it would rise to the summit of power, and, after reaching that position, would die a violent death. As an instance of this strange belief, it is related how Lord Castlereagh in early life saw this spectre, as is well known, he afterwards became head of the government, but finally perished by his own hand. Then there was the dreaded spectre of the goblin friar, associated with Newstead Abbey. A monk, arrayed in cowl and beads and dusty garb, appeared, now in the moonlight, and now lapsed in shade, with steps that trod as heavy, yet unheard. This apparition was generally supposed to forebode evil to the member of the family to whom it appeared, and its movements have thus been poetically described by Lord Byron, who, it may be added, maintained that he beheld this uncanny spectre before his ill-starred union with Miss Milbank. By the marriage bed of their lords, tis said, he flits on the bridal eve, and tis held as faith to their bed of death he comes, but not to grieve. When an heir is born, he is heard to mourn, and when aught is to befall that ancient line, in the pale moonshine he walks from hall to hall. His form you may trace, but not his face, tis shadowed by his cowl, but his eyes may be seen from the folds between, 
and they seem of a parted soul. An ancient Roman Catholic family in Yorkshire of the name of Middleton is said to be apprised of the death of any one of its members by the appearance of a Benedictine nun, and Berry Pomeroy Castle, Devonshire, was supposed to be haunted by the daughter of a former baron who bore a child to her own father, and afterwards strangled the fruit of their incestuous intercourse. But after death it seems this wretched woman could not rest, and whenever death was about to visit the castle she was generally seen sadly wending her way to the scene of her earthly crimes. According to another tradition, there is a circular tower called Margaret's Tower, rising above some broken steps that lead into a dismal vault, and the tale still runs that on certain evenings in the year the spirit of the Lady Margaret, a young daughter of the house of Pomeroy, appears clad in white on these steps, and beckoning to the passers-by lures them to destruction into the dungeon ruin beneath them. And indeed it would seem to have been a not infrequent occurrence for family ghosts to warn the living when death was at hand, a piece of superstition which has always held a prominent place in our household traditions, reminding us of kindred stories on the continent, where the so-called white lady has long been an object of dread. There has, too, long been a strange notion that when storms, heavy rains, or other elemental strife take place at the death of a great man, the spirit of the storm will not be appeased till the moment of burial. This belief seems to have gained great strength on the occasion of the Duke of Wellington's funeral, when, after some weeks of heavy rain and some of the highest floods ever known, the skies began to clear, and both rain and flood abated. It was a common observation in the week before the Duke's interment. Oh, the rain won't give o'er till the Duke is buried. The end of chapter 10